Welcome everyone to the second ever United Steelworkers District 3 Strong as Steel podcast. We are coming to you from the traditional and stolen territories of Coast Salish peoples, uh, specifically the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And uh, I'm here with uh, Dana Sykes, who's going to be the co-host. Uh, Cindy Lee, who's a special guest, and <laughs> uh, Julia McKay, who is our district uh, Indigenous Engagement Coordinator, and who's coming to us on a kind of a Zoomy thing that's not really Zoom, but sort of like Zoom. And um, as we told you in the first podcast, we have Tyler Christensen, who's doing all our tech stuff, and we're in um, the humble offices of Brett Barden. Uh, our communications and political staff in District 3. Today, we're going to talk about the District 3 summer school, Indigenous engagement, Women of Steel, maybe some other stuff. Uh, Cindy, about how the Yankees are in last place. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, maybe not. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, so we can uh, start off and uh, I'll kick it over to Dana to talk about the District 3 summer school. Thanks, Scott. And hello, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, As mentioned, I'm Dana Sykes, the education coordinator, and really excited to be here on a podcast that's apparently on a video. So thanks to the people for not providing hair, makeup, and wardrobe, but we'll get through it. Um, Yeah, exciting things happening in education in District 3. We've got our summer school that just happened up at St. Eugene. Um, We were joined by a number of amazing participants as well as our facilitators and we're really excited about this new location and looking forward to see what happens next year. Um, Also wanted just to talk about our education program a bit, if that's okay. That's totally okay. Okay, (laughs) because our education program is one of those programs that we take great pride in in our union, and it's driven by member facilitators. So our facilitators are across the district. They share their knowledge with our participants and are coming out of our membership. Uh, We've got a couple people here who are actually facilitators. So since you're here, what's your favorite part of facilitating steel worker courses? I want to hold a mic to Cindy, but I can't. Okay, so you're going to go to me first. Um, sure. I enjoy the facilitating because of the engagement with the participants, learning about their work environments, understanding some of their struggles, and working together. I find it empowering. That's my experience. Awesome. Julia? The unionism on Turtle Island is the actually the first course I've ever facilitated, so I, I don't have a big basis of comparison but um, for that course specifically you know there's so much knowledge that we're imparting on our members that most of them don't know so being part of of that is is a big deal and it's um you know it's it's humbling and it's just a really great feeling and definitely as Cindy said the the engagement it's it's great it's great to have that member on member conversation Awesome. Thank you. And for those of you who might be interested in becoming facilitators, I encourage you to talk to your staff rep, let them know to put your name forward. Um, Yeah, we're always looking to increase our number of facilitators and also to get into regions that we haven't been. So let us know. It's a great learning opportunity. I still learn from every course that I teach. So I encourage you to reach out to your staff rep. Dana, can you just tell us a little bit more about the District 3 Summer School and maybe how things have changed over the last couple of years, uh, particularly the this year and last year post-pandemic kind of summer schools? Yeah, no, thanks for the question. That's a great question. Um, we've noticed a lot of shifts in our district school, especially post-pandemic, uh, We've had a huge shift in the generations that are showing up. In the first school that followed the pandemic, when we were up at Trickle Creek still, 90% of the participants were new. And I think this year was pretty close to being the same. Um, Our activists want to know more about what they can bring back to their locals, how to get more active, how to get more 
people to step up and get into positions. And I'm really excited about the future of our union. We were also joined some, by some amazing facilitators, again, who are members of our union, who volunteered their week to help the school happen. And I was really excited to see that as well. And uh, this year we did it at uh, a new venue. And, and I think that was really um, interesting and it's, Part of what we want to talk to Julia about a little bit later in terms of our Indigenous engagement work and reconciliation. Yeah, thank you for reminding me about that as well. Um, we were on Tanaha territory at St. Eugene. And as part of that, we had the great opportunity to work with their interpretive centre as well. Our members learned a lot about the traditional lands that we were in, as well as some of the history about the region. And I think it had a huge impact on our members. Um, can I talk about two more things on education? Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Just a couple more things for people who might be listening and thinking, hey, how can I step up and get active in our union? We've got a couple more opportunities that are available. Again, one which you should talk to your staff rep about. We've got a leadership development program that's run through our international and we encourage um, our staff, our coworkers to send out names of people that they think would be a good fit. And if that's something that you are contemplating, it's a four year program. Once a year, you go to Pittsburgh, you learn about our union, you learn about what it takes to be a leader, um, and other skills as well in that. And that's a program that I think Julia is also a part of, if there's anything you wanted to add on that, Julia. You should. Uh, yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's, a, it's a great program. And there's a lot of, um, um, like you just meet so many people from so many different industries across our union. Um, it, so it really opens your eyes, especially when you come from, you know, like I do an industrial uh, setting and then, you, you meet people from, tell us from, you know, business settings from, you know, Louisville Slugger, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you just get to meet such a broad array of people and so many, and such a diverse amount of people, they have so much to offer. So you, you spend a week, it, it flies by, but it's, um, you just learn so much from the um, facilitators who are amazing, by the way, and also from all your your siblings. It's just a great experience. I just, Cindy, maybe the Yankees should get some different bats from the oh my Louisville God. Slugger because <laughs> they kind of suck. Um, anyway. The I, union I, made I, bats. I did, I did want to say, um, add to what Julia said, because that is one of the great things about uh, our education program in general. Uh, our summer school that we just talked about but it also I think you're going to talk about the regional schools. Um, but the great thing is we're bringing people together from different parts of our union, different employers, different in district three, uh, even when we're just in dis dis just in district three, um, we're bringing people from different provinces, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, and the territories together from different backgrounds, from different communities. And just that, camaraderie and friendship that develops and the the fact that you're not alone um, and you have the same kind of issues all across our union is is I think really powerful yeah agreed um, yeah so thanks for the reminder there are still two more things I'm going to talk about <laughs> my this is Dana's podcast now um, so we also have coming up a regional school in October on October 18th, 19th, and 20th in Winnipeg. Um, we'll be offering three courses. It's mostly for Winnipeg region, but if you're just outside of Winnipeg and want to come on by, we'd love to see you. We're going to be offering unit chair training, uh, financial officer training, as well as a course about bullying and harassment and our roles as union members to address those issues. So the, that will be happening October 18th, 19th, and 20th. Also, if you're in the area, we're gonna be holding a reception on the 17th at the Capitol Grill in the Labor Center. So if you wanna stop by to do that. One final thing I did wanna mention, and it's a shameless plug, and um, I wanna encourage those of you, if you've seen them, if we've posted the, our, it's an extension of what we used to have as our bystander program. It's now called Elevate Action. And it's a program where we're now partnering with the Canadian Football Players Association 
and the United Steelworkers and working with White Ribbon. And we're going to be training spokesmen from across the union. Um, it's a national program, but we're going to be training spokesmen with the CFLPA, the CFL Players Association and Steelworkers, to deliver presentations about what our roles are on when we're addressing gender-based violence and how we can actually be active allies and address things as we hear them and shift our cultures in our workplaces. So those applications are ready to go. They're posted. If you're interested in it, please reach out. We'll give you more information. We're really excited. We've got a couple training sessions where we're bringing in steel workers and football players together to learn how to deliver these messages and a few scheduled into 2024 as well as into 2025. So yeah, I'm really excited about that program as well. It's a good um, expansion of things that we've done in the past. And I'm, I get to do that training? At, yeah, you're in doing November. it. At, yeah, our leadership is doing the training doing in November. It. And we're going to be in Hamilton. Yeah, so we're doing it with the uh, Players Association executive and some of the and steelworker leadership in Canada. So that's pretty exciting. And we're... Um, yeah, we're happy to be able to do that. Um, I see that Cindy's internet went, but I was going to say, Cindy, do you have anything to add about steelworker education? I know you've been in a couple other unions, and so do you have any thoughts on steelworker education? Uh, yeah, I think it's pretty fabulous learning from folks coming from all the industries to Julia's point. Uh, I've come out of the post of workers per se. But listening to the stories and listening to the diversity within our different work and industries is, it's eye-opening. I'm learning just as a facilitator, and I uh, think it's amazing. I think the Steel Worker Education Program is very unique, and I think it's inclusive, which uh, I'm very fond of. Great. Cool. So we're done with your the Dana part? The yeah. <laughs> I'm still here. You're not getting rid of me. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we can talk a little bit uh, about uh, Julia and the role that you're uh, in right now as our Indigenous, Indigenous Engagement Coordinator for District 3. Uh, but also you could like just, I think this is cool. So maybe you can tell us like what your actual job <laughs> is and the local that you're from because I think that I personally think her job is cool. But. <laughs> are you are you talking about my my on site job or my current job? Because they're both Your on site cool, job. Yeah, so. no, no, no. The, <laughs> I was talking about the blasting okay. part, but yeah. okay. so as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm uh, I, I <laughs> work and live on the unceded and traditional territories of the Tanaka and the Stony Peoples, which is uh, I'm in Sparwood. Um, I come out of coal mining. Um, I started at a coal mine here in Southeast BC as a uh, haulage truck driver and moved into equipment operation. Um, you know, I, I joke with the other siblings that I meet along the way. They're like, oh, yeah, we, have, we run this, we run that. And I'm like, oh, that's cute. <laughs> I run things that are much, much bigger than that. Um, and I've since moved into blasting. And uh, it's, it's definitely interesting and um a, a bit of a different um career i guess for for a woman honestly um the the biggest reason though is it's a it's a straight day shift job so <laughs> you, you know you look at the split shift and and being a single parent that straight day shift was a uh, a big deal um, and right now I'm working on a 10 month project with district three out of actually working out of the Canadian national office as the district three indigenous engagement coordinator. It's a mouthful. Um, and that project, um, we're reaching out to locals, talking to presidents, officers, members, um, about how they interact with their indigenous membership. Uh, it's, it's been an amazing learning experience for myself, as well as um, the D6, so the District 6 coordinator, who is Josh George. Um, we're finding a lot of similarities along the way, but also some differences. It's amazing how you can, you know, be in the same country, but you can have a lot of different struggles, a lot of, you know, I, I kind of thought maybe we'd be behind on the success stories, but District 3 is, is kind of showing that we have a lot of successes going on, which is great. Um, and it's just been a very enriching project. 
It's great. That's great, Julia. And I'm glad that others other than me have trouble saying indigenous <laughs> engagement project. But uh, it, it is a, a, a big part of, of um, what we're trying to do as a union. And, and I, I think it's, you know, we're doing land acknowledgements. And uh, we talked about being at St. Eugene and, and uh, exposing um, our members to some of that history. We're doing... Um, the project that you're doing, but we're also doing some training. And I think you mentioned it earlier. Um, maybe you could talk a bit about the, the the course that we're doing for our broader membership, not just our Indigenous well, members. Well, um, you're right. That's, I mean, learning is a big part of that reconciliation piece, right? We're learning. So we're teaching our members and we're learning as members and people. So this course that, uh, that we're offering to our membership is called Unionism on Turtle Island. Um, and to say it's just one thing would be doing it a disservice. Um, it's it's a large education piece on Indigenous history, um, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, how and how we as as not just as members but as people can do better at the reconciliation process. How we can be better allies. Um, so that to me is is. The support that we're getting from, you know, as steelworkers is amazing, but also just to be better people. So it's not just, you know, teaching somebody to be a steward. We're, we're teaching our members just how to be better all around, how to, you know, ask the questions, how to learn more. And that's that's huge. And that's that's just going to progress our reconciliation um, and hopefully progress our, our Indigenous membership as well. And I think there's one piece to add to that. Um, can you talk about the facilitators of the program? <laughs> Always about the facilitators. Yeah. <laughs> so all of our um, previous to um, the current facil facilitators that were trained in March, we had three facilitators. And um, usually it would be one Indigenous facilitator and, and, and one settler. Um, but what's happened is we've had this influx of Indigenous membership, um, Métis, uh, various backgrounds that have just um, have a passion for it. So when we did our training in March in Winnipeg with um, Adrian Pavel and um, oh, Paul Carl at uh, Queen's University, um, it was, it's all Indigenous um, facilitators, and they're just, every single one of them is so passionate about the the course, and they just, they have this drive, they want to get this out to the membership, they want to share what they've learned, and they want to learn more, because each each time, um, like I said, I, I, my first time facilitating on my own was just last month, but having participated in the course, having done the facilitator training each time, I took something more out of it. So we're lucky in that respect as facilitators that we get to share that knowledge, but we also get to learn every time we're doing this. Right. Um, and that's, I think that's key. It's, you know, you can have somebody stand up front and, and chat at you and maybe not really care about the material, but every single person that facilitates this has a passion for it. And, and, you know, I, I, I just, like there's a lot of good examples of us moving forward, uh, you know, working with First Nations and and uh, working in our communities, and uh, the the course uh, is is really been well received. But there's also challenges with with all of this, and um, you know, I know I'm challenged all the time with it as a as a settler, and you know, understanding what we need to do and understanding how we need to prioritize reconciliation. I know where you're at. There's there's some positives with the relationship with the First Nations, but there's also some challenges. Julie, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, well, directly in this area, um, you know, water, water conservation, um, the health of our, our water in this area is um, directly impacted by the industry that's in this area, right? Um, we have four major coal mines who all release water into one one river and that river flows down into the United States. So this has been an ongoing issue with um with the local First Nations and that what's happening to the water. So it's it's really a 
it's a double-edged sword, right? Um, we want good jobs for our members, but we have to be cognizant of what, you know, what the price is for that. And we have to, as steel workers, I mean, we, we have a responsibility to hold our, our employers accountable for that. Not, you know, not just for us, but also for our first nations neighbors. Um, you know, these, these lands are, are where they've, they've lived, they've hunted, they've raised their families, you know, and, and they were pushed off because of colonialism and, and settlers. And we need to be cognizant of what we're doing now as, as those lands are being reclaimed. So I think we're doing a good job here at, at making sure, making sure that, um, you know, that the company in this area, I'm not going to say names. I'm sure we can all Google that, um, is doing what they should be doing to, um, to make sure that the water leaving this valley is safe um, because they haven't been doing a good job at that. And it's, you know, it's in the international news now um, and they should have been working on that a lot sooner, but we're, uh, we're holding them accountable and, and they are trying to do better. And we're, you know, we're trying to work, keeping, keeping the jobs here, but also making sure that those nations have good, clean water. That's great. Um, you know, we're uh, really thankful, Julia, that you're our Indigenous Engagement Coordinator in District 3 and you're doing a great job. And we're really looking forward to uh, both the, you know, outcome from your work, but also continuing to, you know, move forward on that path uh, as an organization, uh, the path towards reconciliation and, you know, making our contribution for... Um, uh, to that process. So thank you again. Uh, we also wanted in this podcast to talk about Women of Steel and the International Women of Steel Conference. I will defer to y'all because <laughs> y'all are Women of Steel and I'm not so much, but maybe we could, uh, somebody could chime this in is, and start talking about Women of Steel. Well, yeah, no, this is also super rare in our union that we're outnumbering Yes, right now. We're taking over, so maybe we should just cut one of the, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot coming up. Um, we are still working on securing all of the names that we need for a district's women's committee, but the women who have been who have been assigned and who are stepping up are are ready to do that and ready to get to work. So that's one of the things that we're working on in District 3. I feel like I'd be doing a disservice, though, in not talking about why women of steel, because we haven't really had this conversation in a long time. Um, and we know this from doing Women of Steel courses or having Women of Steel conferences, the question comes up consistently, like where's the men's committee and why do we have Women of Steel? I see Julia going, yeah, we've heard it. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, that's a reality that a lot of our Women of Steel are facing in their workplaces or this concern about how can we invest in this program when there's only four women in the workplace. Um, and to me, the main reason for that is, yeah, you have to invest. If there's only four women who are working there, there's a problem. Um, our jobs are not always accessible for women in our union. And I think if we don't have the space to have that conversation, we can't have it in a, in a meaningful way. Um, if we're talking, we're still having conversations and poor Cindy is going to have to hear me rant about it again, and maybe I won't. But we still are having conversations about access to basic necessities in a workplace. Like, if we have women working in a mine, they should be able to use somewhere with running water. And I'm going to be cross and I'm going to be graphic, but if women are working with chemicals and they're working with dust, they don't need to be moving into a washroom and inserting those materials into their bodies when they're menstruating. Um, so there's a lot that's going on and there's a lot that we still need to address in our union. So why don't we talk about this a bit? So who wants to go first? Cindy, Julia, let's talk about why women of steel. Um, it's important. It's about being seen. It's about being heard. It's about being recognized as an individual in a workplace. I have every right to be there just as any other male. Um, it's important. We have the basic needs, as does every man, every individual that identifies as such. It's important that 
our basic needs are taken care of. And it is dumbfounding and outstanding to me that we have women who have to go behind a tire to use a bathroom or, do, to your point, does not have running water. We need to do better, and we need our allies, our men in the workplace, to actually stand beside us, not in front of us, in order to bring those um, needs and attentions to management to make it better for all women in industry, especially. Julia? Exactly. Exactly what you said, Cindy. Um, and, you know, I'll relay my, my personal story. So I came into this industry as a single parent, you know, so as a single, as a single mother, you're, you're doing both jobs. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're doing your both traditional jobs. I'm being the mother, I'm being the father, I'm being the breadwinner. Um, I have to discipline my kids. I have to be the, uh, you know, the nurturer and I'm working full time. Um, and I'm working in a man's industry and I have, I had male supervisors who definitely were not supporting my progression in the company. And the turning point for me in all honesty, and I'm, you know, not, not trying to blow smoke <laughs> at all. The turning point for me in my career was coming down to this union hall was joining meetings, was joining women of steel. Um, and it's not just about that. That's a huge part of it, right? I had that support. Now I had that empowerment. I had somebody I could talk to. Um, but there we are. We're also giving back to the community, right? Sarah just packed 99 backpacks to help the community. Um, and a lot of what she does, a lot of what our chairs do here are it's in their spare time, you know? Um, and, and they, they don't think twice about it. They're not going, well, you know, I don't, they're doing it. They're making sure that we have a Christmas party for our kids. They're making sure that we are considering our, you know, our kids that might have different needs when they come to that Christmas party. Um, they're doing everything and they're, they're doing it from the heart. And I've had the conversation with the men. I've had one guy, oh, come on. And I said, Hey, by all means, you can come to a meeting or you can start your own group for sure. I'll help you out with that. And he went, well, no, that seems like a lot of work. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll just carry on doing what we're doing then. Uh, and he, I mean, he was good with it after that. But, it, you know, we had that conversation. Um, and we've never, we've also never denied a, a man or anybody, um, uh, you know, a member's wife. We've never denied anybody. If you want to come, come on out. Yeah, That's and great. We have like great committees that are happening across the district. Like we have women stepping up um, and also being supported by their locals to do some great work across the district. And I'm really excited to see as that progresses, what kind of work that is. Uh, and issues are going to vary in different workplaces and focuses are going to vary in different workplaces. Uh, so for those of you who haven't seen the Women of Steel Committee in your local yet, I feel like you should start one or reach out to any of us and figure out how you can get that happening because it's important that we're there. It's important that we're at, our, at the table and it's also important that our voices are being heard. And I'm really proud of the work that our union has been doing and I'm excited to see us continue to progress and address a lot of those issues. Um, a couple other things we have coming up on Women of Steel is the Women of Steel Conference, the International Women of Steel Conference, which is kind of a big deal. That's coming up uh, October 23rd to 26th in Pittsburgh. And this is a, I was just saying how excited I was to be at a table while well, there's more of us at this table, but when you're at the Women of Steel conference in Pittsburgh, it's an international conference and there's districts from all over our union in both Canada and the United States. And it's quite astounding to be in a room with thousands of women of steel and just to see the power that's coming from that room. Um, also really excited because in Canada, we tend to lead the way on a lot of that. We tend to lead the work in making sure that some of our language is being inclusive and recognizing that um, women and people have different bodies and we need safety equipment to accommodate different bodies. And it's not just one size fits all. Um, not all of us are small men. And we, we're leading in that with our Raising the Bar program, which is now crossing the border. We're also 
leading in those conversations about um, parental leave and what that means. Because in Canada, we have a lot more, we have more rights than they do in the U.S. And I think if we can talk about that even more, uh, it'll make our union stronger and it'll make the make it stronger for women across the border and parents across the border to to make those changes. So, yeah, I'm really excited about this conference coming up. If you, again, need more information, you can find that on the website. Um, and hopefully we get to see people there. Does anybody have anything? I think, you, I think you're going to see a lot about the Raising the Bar yeah. uh, stuff at the International Women's Conference. Because when, yeah. when I was down at the International Executive Board, you know, kind of made our little corner of the table pretty proud to hear that the the bigger union, the U.S. districts had adopted that raising the bar on women's health and safety program. Uh, they'd taken all the work that was done by the National Women's Committee and the CNO and the district coordinators in Canada and brought it to our members in the U.S. And that's, you know, that's a it's a huge thing for us to be to believe to be leading on that. Um, I did also want to say, like um, Dana mentioned, you know, the the men's committee and Julia referenced it. The the first time I ever heard that was a long time ago when we were in a union hall in a local I won't I won't mention. <laughs> and the guy said, well, why don't we have a men's committee? And I, I kind of paused and I looked around the room and I said, what the fuck is this? Like, this is a, there is no women in the room. <laughs> and I'm like, your executive board is the men's committee. And, uh, you know, I laugh about that. But unfortunately, in a lot of our workplaces, there isn't a lot of women. And that reflects into our executive and it reflects into our leadership. And we have to have women of steel and women of steel conferences and committees and coordinators to make sure that the voice of of the women in our union is heard and is part of the leadership and you know it's it's true when folks say that there's too many men too many white men too many um you know uh folks like me at the leadership table it's a true statement um and it means we got to work hard and continue to work hard at programs like Women of Steel and our Human Rights Committee and and all the other things we're doing to be inclusive as a union. So um, I, I just think that's great. And I did kind of want to just def or ask, I know Cindy and Dana, I can't remember if Julie, if you're at the National Women of Steel Conference, but we had a good Canadian Women of Steel Conference too that maybe with a huge group of District 3 folks. So maybe you can talk about that. So he's just looking at me because she's like, oh, yeah, this is where everybody got COVID. <laughs> well, maybe we aren't supposed to Okay, it was great other than that. the COVID. Yeah. <laughs> it, uh, it was my first USW uh, convention experience, and it was pretty incredible. Um, I also had the privilege of getting to speak on a panel about language, um, collective bargaining language, which was very uh, exciting as well. But listening to the stories across this country in terms of how women are stepping forward and attempting to make equity and equality within their workplaces is just, it's fabulous and it's extremely empowering. Uh, I went from that conference feeling very invigorated and ready to take on the world. So I was just taken back at the diversity of the women and everybody coming together, standing together and supporting one another, which was outstanding. I'm going to you, Dana. Well, I was just saying <laughs> if Julia wanted to. Were you in Quebec? No, I, I wasn't. Oh. I was not. Well, you didn't get COVID then. Yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got COVID that. <laughs> Well, that, that's great. I, I'm really glad that we had all of you to be able to talk about the Women of Steel portion as well as the stuff that we've already talked about. Okay, so I think that's what we got for our second ever Strong as Steel podcast. Thank you for watching, listening, uh, and joining us to talk about the stuff we talked about. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, we're going to do more uh, podcasts every I don't know, three, four, five weeks, something like that, whenever we can find some time to squeeze it in. I want to thank Dana for co-hosting. Um, You're welcome. 
Thanks to Cindy uh, for joining us in Brett's office. Uh, and thanks to Julia Thank for joining us on um, this Zoomy kind of uh, program. Uh, and uh, I think it went well. I'm, I'm glad that we got to talk about some of those issues like Indigenous engagement and Women of Steel and our education programs. And so um, please... Uh, the headphones are falling off, but please, uh, please keep following our podcast and, um, you know, give us some ideas. If you want us to talk about anything in particular, uh, you can uh, send in your suggestions, go to the website, usw.ca, I think slash district three gets you to district three and you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter or X or whatever it's called. And yeah, that's a wrap, I guess, of episode two. Can we put this on TikTok? TikTok, TikTok. I'm just, yeah. yeah, I don't know. You mentioned okay. ages before, and I think um, <laughs> everybody here is younger than me, and so uh, including you, Dana. I think and you're so okay, fine. we'll talk if to somebody younger TikTok, about TikTok. If we're doing TikTok, then you have to dance, Dana, because that's a requirement. <laughs>